Now, let's explore the idea of healthy eating or really healthy eating, if we can create that distinction, because I think there's so much information out there um, and we, we think we have a sense of what is healthy eating, but what is it in your opinion? You know, the interesting thing is that it hasn't changed over all these years. We've had strange and wonderful diets crop up and uh, trends in mm. health, but it's getting back to the basics of what a human being actually needs to function in terms of their macronutrients and their micronutrients, and also the way that we farm and we produce food. So we can't forget that the agricultural element is mm. linked you know, to the nutritional uh, quality of our food. Now, in terms of the information that we get, there's so much that is put out as official information. Like, I read an article the other day that said, the White House's definition of a balanced plate is X, Y, and Z. So it comes from these sources that are supposedly credible or in a position of authority, but often they're not because there's a hidden agenda behind them. So where do we source the best kind of information about what really is a healthy diet? Well, you always look for people and historical evidence that indicates longevity mm -hmm. in, in lives. So lots of research has been put together about cultures where there's a long, long life and basically no dread disease or lifestyle diseases. And then you have a look at those principles that are being practiced. And the interesting thing is that they are the same. So whether you're looking at the Mediterranean diet, the traditional Japanese diet, um, the Central European diet that's still traditional. Yes. They have the same kinds of principles that are practiced regardless of changes in technology mm. or farming practices. So that's what you need to look at. What's working? Yes. The yeah. evidence, the evidence-based approach as opposed to the marketing or the brand or the kind of trend-based mm. you know, methods. Let's go into that because that's a very interesting one for me in terms of the idea of marketing and messaging around products. Mm. So you go into supermarket and you see so many things that say superfood or low fat, extra healthy, um, the healthy option, whatever it might be. What sort of, I want to ask the question almost of like what, what um, uh, credibility is there in that kind of messaging? I mean, a broccoli head is obviously healthy. But somebody who says this is the healthy option almost feels as if we should be taking a step back and saying, hang on, what are you really trying to tell me? Mm. In South Africa, unfortunately, our food and our health market is not regulated. Mm. So everyone and their sort of Maltese poodle can actually <laughs> have a, <laughs> a message that they are sharing. Yeah. The yeah. issue here is to step away from the hype. As soon as a message comes across as very uh, compulsive, it's com mm. pump compelling you to say um, yes or to do something, then you know, wait, 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 what are the facts? And also to remember that food is based on your own unique digestion, your own right. unique needs. So we actually have to come back to understanding ourselves, understanding our own physiology, mm. not being afraid of biology and anatomy. I mean, gosh, this is the most expensive thing you're ever going to own, which <laughs> yeah. is you. So yeah. get to know how it works and be aware that unfortunately in the world that we're living now, everything is about selling. Yes, yeah. So just know that it's going to come with that mandate and really filter the stuff through. Absolutely. So one particular word that pops up and it becomes, it, it's become more of a thing in sort of health circles is this idea of superfoods. Um, again, on a packet that says superfoods, is it really as good as it is as sort of looks on the bag because to me the also the minute you put it into a bag and it's been processed what are you losing from the original so how do you find that balance where something intrinsically is a superfood but then when you buy it on a supermarket shelf it maybe isn't as good for you as it says it's a very good point when we look at superfoods it was actually a branding term that okay. kind of came out of a pseudoscience that any plant that has a medicinal value that goes beyond the nutritive value, so the micro or macronutrient value yes. of the plant, is termed a superfood. But that can sometimes mislead somebody. They can mm. think, you know, I'm very, very sick. All I need to do is eat lots of maca or lots of yeah. cacao or lots of moringa. But in actual fact, that has to still form a part of a, a wise and intelligent diet. Mm. Mm. So it's just remembering that a lot of what we are exposed to is what they call pseudoscience. Right. So it's not real science. It's, it's a trend. 
which cottoned on to something that was discovered about that food, you yes. know, maybe 50 years ago, maybe a year ago, maybe now. It's very positive that we're learning these things about these beautiful plants that surround us. But we've got to put them where they belong. Mm. They can't become our staple diet. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I'd like to go back now to the idea you said in terms of knowing your body or, or potentially also listening to your body or experiencing your body maybe is even better in terms of the food that you put into it. So how come for one person, one set of food is going to be absolutely ideal, but the exact same set of food for another person is going to be completely wrong? How do we find that balance? Is it through experimentation, testing, trial and error? What, what's the best philosophy there? So Michael, I'm going to try and cut out all the pain for everyone because <laughs> I've gone through this myself. Okay. And you know, even in my studies, much emphasis was placed on the, the food pyramid. You know, yes. So getting at the base maximum grains and then moving up sort, sort of to the top of the food pyramid which is oils and, and sugars. But that has been literally debunked mm. because it doesn't apply in many cases, especially when you've got um, different stages of life, different energy requirements, different ages. So there's three tools that you can use to cut out the pain because yeah. food trial and error really is painful. Mm, and it's a long process as well. <laughs> very <laughs> long process and it might change based on the food sourcing. Right. So the one is knowing your particular blood group and understanding how that then responds, uh, responds to stresses in your body, acids, mm -hmm. and the way that you digest certain food groups like lectins, glutens, carbohydrates. That's extremely helpful. And there's a lot of research available freely on okay. that. So how your blood group uh, dictates and also informs the, the kinds of foods that are healing, neutral or triggers. Right. Then there's something called genotypes. And genotypes are six categories of genetic profiles that basically define the world. Okay, okay. Very much linked to your blood group, but also to where your ancestors came from. Yes. What types of foods they ate, the antibodies that you have already in your genes and your DNA. Okay. And then the third is understanding the difference between processed food, mm. fresh food, organic food, commercially produced food, so the sourcing of your food. Okay. Because you can obviously be eating something that should be healthy, but because it's so full of pesticides, it's a possible poison or a toxin. Mm, mm. So those are very helpful tools and they don't cost anything, just a bit of research, looking up online, knowing yourself. Yes, yeah. Now, just on that blood type story, is it is it deeper than just saying I'm O negative or B positive or whatever the case may be? Is it is it a further analysis into the actual chemical makeup of your blood type? Yes, it is. In fact, I found it was very interesting to go and look up what blood groups actually mean before okay. I even linked them to foods. Right. So to go and most people don't even know their own mm. blood group. You know, I think that's semi-important, especially <laughs> yeah. if you're in an accident. Absolutely. So to go and find out what your blood group is, if you are a, a negative or a positive part of that, and then what that means in terms of how your body functions, especially how it responds to stress. If you are highly sensitive to stress or you are reactive, mm. it means that your immune system is going to be under pressure a lot more. Okay. So then you're going to have more sensitivities to food and you're probably going to have to be more aware of how you're eating yes. as opposed to having a far more neutral blood group. Okay. That then is linked to food groups. Um, it's often referred to as the blood type diet. Yes, yes. I've heard I'm not that. trying to come and sell that here <laughs> because I actually have nothing to do with it. Okay. But I found it very helpful for my clients who didn't want to go and have all of that allergy testing mm. and spend a mm. fortune and get pricked with so many needles. Yes. You know, so it's a very accurate way of already forecasting Mm, those foods are not going to be so great. Those okay. are going to be better. And then you can try yourself. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay, Charlotte, we're going to continue this conversation after the break. Looking forward to chatting about the South African type of diet that we live with. But we'll do that just after a break. Don't go anywhere because the conversation will, of course, be very interesting as we proceed here on Real Health. So do stay with us.